Uh, he moved to Melbourne in 2004, but before that, Dave and his wife um, lived off-grid for three years on several homesteads, uh, taking care of um, fruit trees, chickens, what else? You name it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and while they were doing that, they fell in love with, um, with mangoes particularly, and just with, uh, with growing um, food, sustainable food, and good plants. Uh, so now um, Dave um, runs Sweet Leaf Aquaponics, and he's a proponent of sustainable, dense planting of food and other useful plants, uh, like non-invasive clumping bamboo and shade trees for home energy conservation. He hopes his experience will inspire other people, namely you guys, to um, build edible gardens and uh, establish other resourceful plants. So Dave's going to talk about sustainable gardening, and then um, after his presentation, there'll be time for Q&A. You guys want to ask some questions? And at any time, please help yourself to coffee, water, fruit, napkins, mm -hmm. seeds. There are free seeds over there. I brought some um, heirloom, cherry, um, Florida Everglades tomatoes seeds. And um, really, one seed is all you need to feed your whole family, but uh, those packets have about 10 or 20 seeds. So enjoy. All right. Thanks, Rose. Thanks to uh, Evans Library After Hours here. This is fun. Um, we'll just kind of keep it conversational. And um, like she said, I live in Melbourne here. Uh, I build aquaponic gardens. And another type of garden that I have is a, a, a closed system called a wicking bed garden. And I'm going to kind of run through pretty much all the, the those two types of gardens in the slides. And you'll see lots of pictures and I mean there'll be time for plenty of questions as well but um, as far as um, who I am like she said I'm Dave Lindemann that's uh, my dog Charlie he's passed now but um, good dog <laughs> the way I learned about gardening was mostly with a shovel I mean that's probably the best way is to just get out there and do it. I mean, you learn from your friends, your neighbors, um, everybody who you talk to has, who's done any gardening has gotten into the dirt and really learned that way. I mean, that's got to be the best way. And to share your ideas and your seeds, I mean, those Everglades tomato seeds that Rose has is just, it's an heirloom plant that comes from South Florida or I don't know where it comes from but it grows really good in warmer climates and they're small really sweet cherry tomato seeds and they're pretty prolific so definitely try them out um, but those, that's the kind of knowledge that you get in your community and talking to other people finding out what's working best for them and everything um, like I said I'm gonna try and keep it conversational but this is just a general overview of the things that are in my slideshow that I'm going to go through. I'm just going to talk about sustainability and plant needs kind of as a general start to the presentation. And then um, the first type of garden that I'm going to describe is the wicking beds. And that's basically gardening in soil. It's a raised bed soil garden. And then the second part, which a lot of people might be interested in, is the aquaponics part. And that's going to be a soilless type of garden. Um, and with this being an engineering school, I really kind of wanted to try to tie in the whole engineering mindset that you can have when you garden. So with the soil gardens, you really got to engineer the dirt. And with the soilless gardens, you want to try and provide some good engineering for the water because that's where your nutrients are going to come from. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about a couple of events, and there's one right out here in the, in the quad or whatever they call it. So sustainable gardening to some people is just having their plants not die. And, you know, that's great. I, I would definitely not want my plants to die. And uh, These are just some pictures I got off the Internet. Uh, just to go back, um, all of those pictures are taken in my backyard. And most of the pictures that are in this slideshow are, are my pictures, but there's some that I just pulled off the internet for general stuff like um, cartoons and such. These 
pictures also show how some people consider sustainable garden more from a, like an ecological, philosophical kind of way. And all of these things, I think, are great philosophies to, to put into your garden. I mean, first, you don't want the plants to die. And second, you really want to be good stewards of the land. And working with nature is going to be a lot more successful than trying to work against it. So if you look at um, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, the way they sus um, describe sustainable is that it produces abundant food, it doesn't deplete the Earth's resources, it does not pollute the environment, it follows the principles of nature, and uh, it develops systems that are self-sustaining. And like I said, from an engineering mindset, you can turn those principles into a systems approach, which is kind of what I hope to, to show you a little bit. Uh, all those philosophies tie into to, to my basic philosophy is that, you know, if I'm going to spend all the time, money, and effort to, to do a garden, it's, I want it to work. I want it to be successful, and I want to have um, some food or some beautiful plants or some other resources that um, are my goals for gardening. Of course, I also want to do it in the most efficient means. I don't want to waste anything. I kind of want to use waste, to be honest with you, which is a great, um, great thing about gardening is because you can really incorporate all of your organic waste into it. Um, and if you think of the term efficiency, I guess a lot of us, especially me, would read into that as it's inexpensive. Because honestly, food is pretty cheap in this country. I mean, even if you do buy organic food, you can eat reasonably inexpensively. And um, to grow it yourself would be much better and probably healthier and ta more tasty. But you still have to kind of weigh the cost benefits of doing it. So. I really like this quote, leave nothing but footprints, take nothing but pictures, and kill nothing but time. And those are great concepts for sustainable gardening. And hopefully everybody here kind of has a, a similar mindset and um, kind of feels that they should work with nature when they're doing their gardens. With that said, the engineering perspective going back, you've got you've got to provide these four things in order to, to, to have a sustainable garden. Light and air are pretty much taken care of for us here in Florida outside. Um, the water and the nutrients are definitely not as easy and those are where I'm kind of putting my my engineering hat on in order to provide for my gardening system. So these kind of show the two points the two types that I'm talking about. On, on the first one here, this is actually um, a floating raft aquaponic system. All of those holes represent one plant space, and this is a, a completely waterproof system that holds about 12 inches of water. It sits right on the ground. In the back here is your fish tank, and as the water pumps, as water uh, there's a pump that pumps water from this end of the growing system back up to the fish tank. And as it gets higher, it overflows and comes back into this end of the raft system. So it's basically just a water flow in a circular way with gravity and a small water pump. The, the, a water pump for this system probably is only about maybe a 100 watt light bulb running say 24 hours a day, or you could put it on a timer and run it more so during the day. Uh, the other system, and I just put these rain barrels up here kind of as an example because the water has to be, that's the key to an aquaponic system. Um, as far as uh, the other type of gardening um, system that I'm going to talk about, uh, I have what I call is a wicking bed. And if you Google wicking bed, you could probably find a lot of information. And there's, I mean, people have been doing this for a long time. I, I didn't invent it. But I did kind of take all those concepts and just kind of 
put the things that I could buy here and put it together to, to try and turn what I think is um, a, a good method for Florida, for Melbourne, to build a wicking bed. Um, basically, this is just the guts of it. When you have the garden, it's full of dirt, and you, you wouldn't see any of this piping or any of um, the framework. There's a, a pond liner in the bottom, but I think that both of these closed systems are helpful because you can really um, be successful by conserving your water and then also preventing the plants from not having water mostly, as well as keeping your nutrients in and engineering those nutrients, whether it's water or soil, to continue and improve and feed the plants. So I'm going to first talk about the wicking beds, um, and then I'll get to the aquaponics. But the wicking beds really is just about having the dirt. You know, you, I, my goal is to conserve as much water as possible and make sure the plants always have water. But really, besides the water, the plants get their nutrients from the dirt in this type of system. And because of that, I also add a uh, worm composter into this closed system. So you can add your vegetable scraps right into the garden bed and you can have your vermicomposting going at the same time you're growing plants. And I've had it where I've put the, uh, built one of these gardens, planted it with completely with tomatoes, put the worms in there, and then six months later I took a scoop of dirt and it was richer and better and I had just grown tomatoes for six months too. So you're actually improving the soil as you're taking advantage of the benefits of that. So I'm just gonna kinda go through the wicking garden. I won't take too long, but um, I'm gonna show you kind of a step-by-step. -step. You know, This is sort of the end step, and the last picture you saw was sort of the beginning step. Um, but they're also known as self-watering gardens. Um, the plants basically can wick the water from underneath where their root system is. Uh, it's great for water conservation. And like I said, the worms really do the, uh, do the tilling. They're, they're the workhorses in this system. The steps to build one are first to build the garden frame. And then what you do is you add a pond liner. I basically build the frame right on the ground, and then I dig out the inside about six inches below the, the actual level of the ground, put the pond liner in there, um, add the piping. And the piping really is just a good way to distribute water throughout the, the, the whole garden versus if you just put the mud in there or the soil, it would eventually be mud and it is mud where there's no piping because it's basically just dirt sitting in the water. Um, and then I add the worm composters and the plants. This is the first step, like I said, and just to make it easier to, to put the pond liner in, I, I, oops, I add um, a two by four basically right around here to um, have something to nail it down to. Uh, and, and as you can see, the outside of the box is really level with the ground, and the inside is maybe six inches deeper. This is just another view. Um, I think it's the same one. Yep. Uh, the one thing to note here is you definitely want your box to be level, because it is going to be holding water. And <coughs> The easiest way to get the water to flow the way you want it to is to, to have it level. There's the level. That's why I was. <laughs> um, this is a pond liner. Um, I purchased these at uh, Ace Hardware in Merritt Island. They have a pond garden area there. I mean, they specialize in water <coughs> gardens. This particular pond liner is safe for fish. Um, you can find pond liners online. 
that people will sell and it's basically the same product as they use for roofing. So you want to stay away from the just the EPDM roofing material because it is a petroleum based product and you want to make sure you get the, the pond safe, fish safe stuff. Um, on this bed I actually pl put an overflow in the side right there. Um, all of them would have to have an overflow because if you get a lot of rain, I mean, it'll fill up in just a few minutes, um, especially a good Florida rain. So I put an overflow and that goes outside of the box about even with the, the ground level and you can divert that water to a banana tree or anything else that you think might really benefit from it. This piping is um, your basic uh, drain field piping that you would get at um, Lowe's or Home Depot or, or someplace like that. It is perforated. Th there's holes completely throughout this pipe. So if you put water in it, it'll just flow right out into the soil that's going to be around it. Um, the stuff that I get has what's called a sediment sock, and that prevents any of the dirt from getting into the pipe. So you, at the very least, you'll always have the volume of water of this pipe in your bed. Um, the, the plants, I guess, could wick it out of there, but in my experience, once I fill these up with a well or rainwater barrels the first time, and I've had them three, four years now, and I, I rarely ever water. I mean, if it's dry for about a month, then you might want to fill it back up with water. Or if your plants are doing great, I mean, tomatoes do use a lot of water in the middle of the summer, so you might need to put some water in then. But if it rains two, three times a week, or even once a week, you usually are pretty good without ever having to water these gardens. Um, so you, that's the framework, that's the engineering part of it. We've, we've built the system, and now we're gonna go to the soil part. Uh, I've composted all of my newspaper. Uh, I've been told, um, uh, I went to a workshop at the Funky Chicken Ranch, I don't know if any of you are familiar with them. She was, she, her um, research said that all newspaper that's um, produced in this country now has to be vegetable based ink, so it, could be, it can't be toxic ink. ink. So I use all of my newspaper um, the shredding of it just helps increase the surface area and, and the worms can kind of compost it even more easily, but you could just throw in cardboard or anything. Um, it adds a lot more volume and air to the soil as well, and in three or four months the worms are going to eat it all anyways. I just use some um, leaves or whatever other organic compost that you have available. This is pine needles because there was a lot of pine trees in my yard. Um, this is just kind of uh, the first level of dirt that went in over the pine needles. And then I really try and fill it up as, as high as possible. And even when I first build these, I'll sometimes mound it like a, like a grave or something because the, the, once the worms start composting, I mean, that dirt will fall. And in a one-foot bed, you might lose three or four inches of height. And as water and the worms do their job, the, the soil gets compacted some as well. So as far as worm composter, this is pretty basic. Um, all I do is take a pretty decent um, pot, you know, something that's heavier duty plastic or something that's not going to just fall apart, and drill as many holes in this pot as you can until you're tired of drilling holes. And that basically provides a place to put your vegetable scraps and a place for the worms to to start their colony, but they'll go out th from the holes throughout the entire garden. They'll go through the whole bed um, and, like I said, really increase their engineering the soil the whole time we're there. 
So this, um, this is an older slideshow that I did uh, back in 2011. And that bed on October 26 was planted with some starter plants. Uh, you can see right in here, that's the worm composter. I use a, a clay lid or something a little heavier because animals do like worms. Birds like them, raccoons like them. So something a little heavier where it will prevent critters from actually getting into not only the compost, but the worms. What size holes are those that you drill into that? Uh, a quarter inch is probably good. Uh, you you want to go a little bit bigger. You know, the, the, a small. They probably can get through a screen size hole, um, but it's just easier if you drill bigger holes. I wouldn't go too big because then all your dirt and all your compost will just fall out. So October 26th. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much time that is. December 4th. Same bed, same kind of picture. Um, the things grew pretty good. I, that was the one time I, water, I filled it up when I started. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in this bed, I also make sure that all the piping that's in here is connected with a T, and there's a, a fill pipe upwards. So you can actually put a hose in there and fill it. And while you're watering it, that water will go through all the piping that's in the system. So that's the wicking bed. Um, I love them. They work really good. They are great for pretty much any type of vegetables, um, tomatoes, lettuce, really anything, watermelons, squash. Really, you probably want to think more about the season than um, that, the plant in this kind of system. Go ahead. Do you like potatoes, tubers, roots, raw Potatoes, you probably, you know the best potatoes that I did? I had some sweet potatoes in a pot, and I actually put the pot right on top of this bed, and the roots grew through, and the potato broke the pot. So with root vegetables, you can either build a taller box or maybe kind of raise them up a little bit more because their roots are going to find the water. But they don't want to be submerged in water. And so a foot is probably the minimum you need for a, a large plant like a tomato. Um, and that's why I kind of dig down the six inches. An 18 inch height is really the perfect height for a tomato plant. But most smaller plants, lettuces and such, are are great with just a 12 inch um, space requirement really for their root systems. So you're saying that even if uh, it's, a, it's like a four inch perforated pipe with a sock on it and once you fill it up it's it gets filled up it doesn't leak out? It leaks right out yeah but um, if it rains that water will fill it back up because the perforation goes both ways and um, the plants only drink as much as they want, you know. That's the really nice thing is that when you water your plants in a regular just soil garden, whatever they don't get goes in the ground, it's gone forever. Um, if the plants are thirsty later on in the day, they're, they don't have access to the water unless you water it. Here they do. Well, yes, sir? Um, I just use a screen. Basically, that overflow is a coupling, and then you just take another whatever size pipe, put a piece of screen over it, and stick it in the coupling. I mean, it's, that's the simplest, easiest way to do it. And um, the dirt doesn't really flow out of it. I mean, you really have to have like water pressure to push it through a screen. Uh, the worms aren't going to go out because they have all the food they want where they, you know, they're, they're only going to move to the place they want to be. Yes, sir? What's the advantage of building the box above ground versus just digging deeper in the ground? The you could do that. I mean, it's just more work and also you have to figure out where your overflow is. Um, 
I buried my electric line in my yard and the FPL wanted me to go 12 inches deep and I hit water. So your box is probably going to last longer above the ground and when you bury it, you know, there's termites. I mean, we're in Florida, it's going to be wet and there's going to be bugs. Three things I have questions. One is, what was the layer, of, was it like six inches of the paper, cardboard, and then six inches of soil? Based on what, what is it, about 12 inch of height? Uh, honestly, I would say that that pipe is four inch perforated pipe. Mm -hmm. So I just cover it with um, paper. Um, it's not, there's, the paper's just fluffy. I mean, it's gonna be constant. It's, it's just gonna be immediately basically crushed down. So just fill it with as much stuff as you have. I mean, you, you could fill the whole thing with, with just dirt, but I mean, if you think about this, this is like four yards of dirt on a four by eight bed, mm -hmm. which is two pickup loads full. I mean, it's a lot of dirt. So the more compost that you can acquire versus having to get a dump truck tr dump in, and this is just one bed, you know, it's Four by eight, it's not that big. What type of worms? Uh, they're red wiggler worms. I mean, they're the best composting worms that there are. Um, they're smaller worms, but they breed really fast and they compost their weight really fast as well. And you could put earthworms in there, you know, whatever's accessible. But if you can get a hold of some, uh, a colony of red wigglers, I mean, typically people pay about 35 bucks for a, a pound or whatever it is, but you'll have them for the rest of your you know, rest of your career and <laughs> gardening pretty much once you have them. Uh, yeah, hey, right here. Yeah, so the soil that you're putting back in, is it the soil that you dug out of the ground? Are you using the native soil? Um, that's a good question. I, you, typically, I get bulk potting soil um, from a nursery, and they have areas as big as this library where they just compost everything, you know, they add all of their tree waste, all of their leaves, and they till it with big tractors and everything. I mean, it, they can do it on a, on a large scale. Um, so the initial, I will mix in some of the soil in my yard, the stuff that I think is decent or better. I mean, you just want to source where you're getting it from. If you have a garden or if you have pots full of stuff that you want to add in there, um, like I said, I add any organic that I can get my hands on, you know, if you have oak trees, put oak leaves in there, if you have pine trees, put pine, you know, so you're basically building it with organic. In the back. Can you please give me about the price for one bed? That bed right there is four by eight and completely with the dirt and everything, including the worms, I will come to your house and put it in for $600. But today, since you're here, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, on the radio, I, I, I said if, um, if you came to this presentation, it'd be 550. Is that pressure treated wood? Or is that it is pressure treated. Um, this box particularly is not, um, I still have it and it hasn't rotted yet. That was kind of some cedar wood that I I acquired. Um, it, it's good wood and it's expensive. The pressure treated I don't like at all and on this early bed I didn't line it but all the ones that I do now are pressure treated but they're completely lined. The entire inside is completely lined and I just poked the hole with the um, with the pond liner. Yeah, the, the, the pressure treated doesn't touch any of the dirt. Um, the pressure tree is on the outside. Uh, they don't have creosote in it anymore. I mean, they've made pressure treated chemicals so that kids can eat them on playgrounds or something, but I still don't really. Uh, another method that I've done before, and I don't know if any of these pictures show it. This one, this one kind of shows it. Um, I basically lined it with like a different kind of plastic. Um, there, it was just thick plastic that I had to keep the, any contact with the pressure treated wood off. 
but today what I would do is um, just put the pond liner all the way up to the top and then you just have to cut a hole where your overflow is so y you would have a lot less um, contact. So if there's no more questions about wicking beds we can get on to aquaponics which people may be a little bit less familiar with. Size the uh, lumber is on the outside? Uh, I use 2 by 12. 2 by 12, because that gives you the 12 inches, yeah. and then you yeah. try and dig down about 6 inches. And you can build them any size you want. I mean, if you have lumber, or you could probably build them out of blocks or whatever materials you have available if you're a DIY kind of guy. Um, soilless garden is going to be more involved in the water engineering. Uh, some examples of Soilless gardens that you may have heard of or may know about are um, NFT pipes. Uh, this is very similar to the raft style aquaponics that I build. Um, these towers, you see tons of stuff on the internet about closed systems. I mean, you could probably buy one of these towers and they have either water pumps or aeration systems. Um, the plants just live in a, a soilless mixture, whether they're clay balls or other different types of um, basically inert materials that the roots can just hold on to. Um, it, here you can see, and it's probably not very good lighting, <coughs> but um, the soilless mixture that is most readily available that I use is uh, cocoa core. And you add vermiculite and cocoa core, maybe about 30, 70, 60, 40, and mix that together. And that is basically pH neutral soil. It's not a soil, it's an it's a organic median, but it's, um, it's considered soilless. Garden soil, on the other hand, is, has a lot more um, minerals and other types of things in it. As you can see, this one's in a greenhouse. Um, in Florida, the one thing I would definitely recommend doing something like this, and I think BCC up on Post Road is probably a good example of not using it like this because the volume of water isn't big enough to withstand the sun and the heat here. So two hours, if you have a pipe full of water that's this big, and it's sitting in full sun in Florida in the middle of the summer, I mean, it's going to boil your plants. You pretty much guarantee the water's going to get over 85, 90 degrees in temperature. Does the water stay in that PVC pipe, or does it just flush it once an hour? A lot of times, they, you, you could make the system however you want, but a lot of times they do have it pumping, but still those pipes are just not enough volume. Even if the water's flowing, it's going to get hot, even if it's only a short span. I've always had, if, if I overwater my plants, they die. If it's sitting in water all the time, what keeps that from happening? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, they can't sit fully in the water. Um, all the plants that are in my aquaponic system are in a two-inch raft. So they have two inches where they're out of the water completely, and then their root systems grow depending on every plant system is a little bit different. They grow the way they want, you know. Some plants will actually, the roots will kind of grow up and the whole plant will be actually above the raft. Uh, with the water engineering, and, and this is kind of a chemical engineering sort of system, um, if the plants need to get their nutrients from the water, this is really important. The pH has to be right. Um, and every different mineral has a different pH where the plants can absorb it more readily. So if you look at like your coppers and your zincs, they, the plants absorb these minerals when the pH is further towards the acid scale. Some of the other minerals like calcium and magnesium, the bigger it gets, the more the plant can absorb it they're going to like it uh, more alkaline. Um, and plants need basically all of these minerals to some extent. 
but typically in an aquaponics system, you're going to want to keep your pH level somewhere above 6 and below 7. 7 being completely neutral. Um, plants in general do like it more acidic, I would say. Uh, but in an aquaponics system, you have to also consider your fish. And fish would probably like it more up here in the 8 to 9 range, <coughs> depending on your fish. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds, but plants do probably good like right here at the five and a half where this starts to taper off and fish like it here so this is a good compromise we're right in the middle changing your pH that's a whole nother presentation to be honest but uh, aquaponics 101 is really the basics I mean there's a ton of stuff about aquaponics to learn out there um, there are a lot of people who are teaching it. Um, you could probably find three or four courses even right here in Florida. I know there's a guy in Winter Park who has an aquaponics system that's set up behind a strip mall in a small corridor. Um, there's some people uh, in Brooksville, I believe, that have some greenhouse aquaponics. Um, there's a lot of people throughout Florida who are doing aquaponics and are trying to teach people about it. But really, the basics are that you have two, two systems that are combined together to gain the benefits of the waste of each. So in aquaculture, which is also a pretty big industry here in Florida, the fish need clean water. You constantly will either have to change your water or really have a, a high-tech filtration system if you're raising fish on a commercial level because you're going to have denser stocking and you're going to really need to give the fish clean water. So the, in the aquaponics, the plants will clean the water for your fish. At the same time, with just a hydroponic system of gardening, um, you have to add nutrients to your water in order for the plants to survive, which is where the fish would come in because the nutrients from the fish waste would feed the plants and then the plants would in turn clean the water for the fish which is why I consider this a sustainable method and pretty pretty neat way to kind of mimic the natural cycle. Um, I guess I kind of already talked about this uh, you know the beauty of aquaponics is that you don't have to go to the hydroponic store and buy nutrients, buy Bloom Buster, or buy something in a box that's a nutrient, whatever, I don't know, could be organic, could be um, chemically made, but the fish waste is definitely something that comes from nature, and um, really the plants don't get the nutrients directly from the waste, they get it from the nitrifying bacteria that actually break down that waste on a micros microscopic level um, and produce basically nitrogen for the plants to take for nutrients. Not having soil eliminates a lot of in soil-borne insects and diseases and uh, not using chicken manure or mammal-based manure could prevent you from having problems with E. coli bacteria. This is like the most simple aquaponic system that I've ever had. So I had a piece of uh, the raft material, it's um, two inch styrofoam, and drilled a couple holes in it and added a couple of strawberry plants and an oregano plant, and just have it floating on the top of my fish tank. The fish are in the same system and this, they're not separated. So depending on the fish you would have, they might eat these plants. If you had tilapia, for instance, you would not have plants because they would clean the bottom of every root that started to poke out of this plant. Um, but with little goldfish or you know aquarium fish, it works pretty good. This is kind of a, a big shot of my backyard. Um, 
what I'd like to do here is kind of show you how I built this system, give you some ideas on um, how to build a raft style aquaponics system, and then you know I'll definitely be available for more questions as well. This is a start. Um, once again, I used uh, pressure treated lumber. These are actually just two by six boards. And um, I bought landscaping timbers because they were on sale for $1.99 each. I uh, cut them up and put a spike on it just to make it easier to drill them in. A really good tool. This is a 35 foot long. Um, what will be the garden trough, and a really good tool for leveling, I call the um, redneck laser level, is a, a water level. Basically, you fill a clear tube with water, and wherever the water is on one end of the tube, if you lift the other end up, that's going to be level. So you can go around the side of a house and have two guys and mark where it is, but basically, I did this leveled this whole thing by myself with um, a 50-foot piece of uh, plastic piping and some water. The other thing that I did for my plumbing was that I buried it all underground. Uh, once again, I kind of want to stress that PVC pipe in full sun is going to get hot in Florida. And any water that's inside it is going to be hot too and it's really not good for the plants. Um, I mean I think tilapia can live in like 90 degree water and they probably would thrive in it but a lower temperature you can keep your water the better for your plants. I mean if your water is 40 or 50 degrees which doesn't happen too often here that's really not bad for your vegetables. They they do not mind it too much. There are summer vegetables, of course, that would prefer it to be warmer. But your typical lettuce, tomato, those kind of it, normal standard vegetables don't mind cold. Not freezing, though. So where the fish bed is, this is um, a 300-gallon stock tank that I bought at Tractor Supply. As the water gets up to the top, it flows down through here, and then it comes up in the bottom of the first vegetable trough. And then it flows to the other end of the trough, and then goes out to the next trough. And I built the trough so that each one is exactly one inch lower than the other one, so that they kind of um, by gravity flows through the whole system. What I used was um, a half inch basically styrofoam insulation. It's a dense blue styrofoam and that also helps with insulating the water. Um, the, the, the ground is a great insulator but since these are above ground and they're built of wood I, I used a little bit. It also prevents, because I'm actually using a liner for these beds, it would prevent just a simple spike or something from poking a hole in it. Um, this liner is a vinyl liner that was um, described to me when I took a, a course from Friendly Aquaponics. They have a aquaponics farm in Hawaii that has organic certification and they're using this exact same product so I just bought the exact same thing that they um, have in their manual and it's lasted really good it's a string reinforced um, vinyl poly kind of um, material and um, supposed to have a pretty long shelf life like I said I think I got the water flowing in this June of 2010, so I've had no problems in almost five years. This is the first um, vegetable garden trough uh, that I got built. 
I painted the pressure treated even more, even to give it one more level of protection from the elements. Um, as you, as I kind of want to reiterate the um, the inside of this bed doesn't touch any wood. It's completely lined by the uh, by the vinyl cover. On the top <coughs> level, I do nail an unpressure treated piece of wood, just pine um, fairing strips is probably the best thing. And as far as how the plumbing works, in the very bottom I used um, a toilet flange and then a, a, a spacer and basically it pinches the liner between the two. So the bottom of the bed where the plumbing is connected is a toilet flange and the top is just a spacer that's screwed down on top of it and the, the liner sandwiched in the middle. So I set the whole system up kind of going back to my engineering mind which I don't have an engineering degree but probably if, if that's something you're studying you probably come up with a lot better ideas on how to do this. But my goal was to make sure that each one of these troughs could be isolated and either drained or cleaned or if there was a problem, if there was say a leak or something, the rest of the whole system could still be useful and continue to run while I had to either fix or maintain or do something with any other part of the system. So that was one of the things in your systems approach, try and come up with an idea. And I think you were saying that um, you had a very similar idea in your garden. So the first one I got completely up and running and it was basically on its own while I built three more of these uh, garden troughs and they're each about 35 feet long and the total system probably holds somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 plant spaces. <coughs> Just to kind of give you a close up on, this liner is kind of a stiff material. Um, in, the, in the corners, to get a square bed out of a flat liner. I kind of wrapped it like a Christmas present and tried to make it neat and so um, it, it worked out pretty good. There's not a lot of extra surface area that could cause problems. And you really don't want any big gaps or wrinkles or holes because organic material could build up there and then if you get really bad rot, you're going to have anaerobic problems, which could cause your water to have too much ammonia, kill your fish and your plants. This is one way that I leveled the ground. I basically just made a jig. Now that I know the, the sides were level, I made a jig where this piece of plywood is nailed to this bigger piece of two by four and you just basically plow the whole thing and you have perfectly level ground. And then once again the styrofoam went in and the PVC liner and uh, the raft material was also a material that I learned from Friendly Aquaponics who has organic certification. It's a uh, high density blue board. Um, the two inch styrofoam is not common here in Florida so it's kind of a special order thing. I did find one Lowe's that had it at one time but they're, they're not carrying it because they don't really sell it. But if you contact a building supply place they can order it for you. So like I said, the first one I got up and running, had plants and seeds going, and then these other three, I built them, and once I got the water filled in, I cycled these three.
by themselves while this other one kind of served as its own system. Now when I say the term cycling, that's a whole other process, but when you first get your water going, you need to basically establish the nitrifying bacteria which are going to break down your fish waste <coughs> and turn it into something that's useful for the plants. So there's different ways to do it. It'll just naturally happen if you let this water flow in a circle in outdoors for two or three weeks. Um, you know, I once a day would just take the fish tank water and hose it in here for about, I don't know, five, ten minutes. Um, and that was enough waste to get the ammonia to build up and get the bacteria colonies established. You can buy nitrifying bacteria in a, in a store. Um, that works just as good. I don't know, you don't really want to research whether it's organic or you know, whatever your philosophy is on that. I, I don't know how they establish it. I think they just try and concentrate natural colonies of bacteria, but maybe they feed it something to, to make it thrive in a more dense. Uh, like I said, th these are kind of the roots. Um, the two inches, each of these cups has a mixture of the vermiculite and the cocoa core, and then the roots will go down as far as they want or up as far as they want. And these are some of the gardens in my backyard. Uh, I just pulled this one out as an example. And even though the water's only 12 inches deep, let's say maybe 11 inches, it's actually probably closer to 10 because I have two inches of styrofoam. Um, but it will go up probably to 12 as the water level rises and falls from the rain. But these roots can be two feet long, they can be real long. Do you put seeds in or do you use the starters? You start seeds um, and then put them in the container? So I'll get to that okay. in just a second. Uh, just to kind of finish off, th this one, all these plants were growing in um, basically just 12 inches of water with a 60 gallon an hour pump, just a regular pond pump, and gravity flow through all four of them for about six months, and there was no other sources of aeration or anything. It was just constant flood plants. Uh, I was informed that your plants will do better if you add an aeration system, so this was kind of a, a a little bit more expensive of a process, but what I did was I piped um, half inch pipe and I purchased a air blower like they would use at an aquarium store or um, a lot of ponds will have aeration systems, but these are all the air stones and I put them every four feet inside this aquaponics um, vegetable trough and they constantly just give aeration like it. they're just like a uh, aquarium air stone and to be honest I'm not sure that um, it made that much of a difference I, I, I couldn't really tell a huge difference I think more important is your water temperature and that's another chemical engineering thing is that your water that's colder is going to hold more oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that can stay inside a 60 degree pond is a lot higher than the oxygen in a 90 degree pond. And the fish definitely need it, you know. So even if the vegetables don't, if you have fish in this system, you definitely want to have sufficient air. If the water temperature is colder, they don't need as much. But if it's hotter, they definitely need more air. Um, the aquaponics water is great for other vegetables and for soil gardens as well. 
I kind of have my overflow right here at a, um, this mango tree that's right next to it, and it really thrived on it. So these are just some examples of some of the other gardens that I've built around Brevard. Um, this is in Melbourne Village. Uh, I actually built um, uh, a, a guy I know, a friend of ours, uh, had a bunch of raised gardens and I built these two wicking beds in his um, garden area. Here's an aquaponics system that I built in Palm Bay. Um, they had a shed right kind of on the left here and we put the fish tank behind the shed just because it would be shaded and the vegetable troughs are um, on the side where they get a lot more sun and he found out that it got a lot more sun than he really wanted and he actually put up a shade cloth over it. Um, it does get hot here for sure. <laughs> He didn't seem to think it was the water temperature, um, but the plants just that he had were, were kind of getting burned from the sun. I mean, it is, this was completely full sun with no other trees or anything around there. Um, the water temperature in one of these 12-inch troughs is pretty insulated because, like I said, I put the half inch on the inside. I've got the two inches of wood mostly. And this two inch raft is a great insulator, and then the ground. So, how far you, down did the ground go? These sit right on top of the ground. You mean the pipes? Oh, I just buried them enough so that I wouldn't trip over them. Um, you kind of have to, in order to get a toilet flange and a piece of pipe and a, and a 90 degree, you need to probably go at least like six or eight inches down. And it's four inch pipe, so I mean it, 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 as little as I could with, it, with the ability to get a 90 degree and a flange. Uh, this one in Melbourne Beach, a friend of mine, she actually got three of these built. Um, the first one she liked so much, so we did a couple more, and then she did, or did one more, and then she said, no, I need another one. <laughs> Uh, these are really small ones. Um, this is uh, over in Melbourne near O'Galley. They uh, had a little courtyard area and were really interested in collecting some rainwater and um, composting and growing some like garden, uh, just culinary herbs, basically kitchen herbs. So this is just a smaller wicking bed system um, right there in their, in their courtyard. Port St. John, I built an aquaponics system here. This one's a little different because we actually built one side higher. So instead of having um, four, four feet across and one foot down, this one is two feet across and two feet down, you know, generally speaking. I mean, those aren't the exact dimensions. And they have the fish tank back here, flows into the taller one, then into the shorter one, and then the pump pumps it back up. Um, honestly, I think it's about the same volume. They just wanted to really test out whether having a deeper water would be better for larger plants like tomatoes. And I haven't talked to them lately, so I don't necessarily know if their research um, came up with that. And then, the, and then these are just really small ones. Um, I have on some other presentations actually brought a, like a mini system where I set it up, but it's, it's pretty difficult to move the water and the plants and the fish, especially inside like a, a academic college. But you can do this for probably 50 bucks or something. Get a Rubbermaid tote and um, a sm the small pond pumps that Lowe's are maybe $15. And basically you have a pump that pumps from inside this, uh, this is a concrete mixing tray, pumps it up into the um, tote, and as the water gets up to close to the top, I drill the pipe in there, it overflows back into the other side of the vegetable garden. So you're basically just flowing your water around like that, and you've 
put some goldfish or whatever kind of fish you can get a, your hands on. Uh, this is another little wicking bed that somebody wanted to put in the side of their yard. Um, some of the other projects that I do also, you know, when you're out at your garden, you kind of want to be in the yard and sort of make an outdoor living space. So I've done some other landscape projects that just been fun to do. Um, this is just more decorative along the street. Uh, these boxes take some of the concept of the wicking bed involved, but he wanted to plant bamboo, so it's not completely closed. But we did put some plastic in there just to prevent all of the water loss that you're going to get from a raised garden. Uh, and then this is a greenhouse that we built out in the woods. And um, this is where I'm trying to encourage all of you to build your own garden. And please let me know if you need help or you, know, you just want some tips. Uh, I'm happy to share my experiences and hopefully help you um, build your own gardens. Also, I want to let you know that today, tomorrow afternoon, FIT Garden Botanical Fest is uh, great vendors out there. Um, a lot of plant knowledge, you know, everything from bananas to bromeliads, you're going to, you can learn a lot. How can... So, so why do you build before you fight? It's not a pressurized system, so the more volume you have, the easier the water can flow through it. Four inch was about the maximum that I wanted to spend without getting too crazy. Because once you get to six inch, you know, the, uh, even four inch is not as cheap. You didn't find anything small. You just started. Um, on the smaller aquaponics, yeah, I've used two inch or one and a half. I mean, really depending on the size, I mean, if all the ones that I've done, I've started with ba basically at least eight by four. And with an eight by four, you're not really talking about that much. And to save, say, $10 on the pipe, you will get some algae buildup and everything. So the water flow is going to be a lot less after you build it. And it's only going to get less and less. So the best thing is to kind of start with the maximum for your budget. That's a good question. The bacteria lives basically on any surface. And it even lives on the surface of the plant roots. Um, the proponents of the other type of system, which is a drain and flood system, would probably say that your bacteria um, colonies is a lot greater because there's a lot more surface area. I think that they're probably right to an extent. Um, you have a lot more expense when you come with a, a flood and drain. And for the number of plants, I didn't really see the benefit, cost benefit, to really make as big a difference. But I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I do know people who do it. And you can buy. Um, a flood and drain aquaponic system from like Murray Hollum. And I don't know if anybody's done any research. He's like the godfather of aquaponics. He's an Australian guy who sells these videos on how to produce your fish and your food in your backyard. And he'll sell you probably an aquaponics that might be twice as big as this. And it's like $3,000. So for $3,000, I kind of built my system. <laughs> But please come check out the Botanical Fest. And also, if you're in the neighborhood, you should come down the street. I live um, right on 2100 Country Club Road. And I am liquidating a lot of the potted plants that I have. So I've got some mango seedlings, some dragon fruit, some black bamboo, some papaya plants, some mulberry trees. Um, just a variety of different things. Some of them are, are edible, and uh, if anybody's interested, come by, and I'll have a bunch of plants for sale as well. Um, it's almost to 192 right on Country Club Road here. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to mention is that I am kind of keeping ele April 11th on my calendar as a day where I would be um, interested in maybe getting some people together to do an all-day Saturday workshop. Basically, it would be a hands-on aquaponics workshop. Um, if I had probably six or eight people that were interested and would want to sign up, I could probably uh, figure out um, whether or not we can get that done. Typ typically, what happens is I uh, have an, I'm an affiliate with Friendly Aquaponics in Hawaii, and they've actually produced a manual. So I do uh, the training based on their manual, and then I do all the hands-on stuff based on the things that I've built in my garage. So if you are interested in that, um, I have cards, and you can email me and let me know um, if that's something you'd want to do. And don't forget daylight savings. <laughs> Another good time to get your uh, Saturday is the time change. So brace yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, so no. And that Go system ahead. that you have there in your yard, the aquaponics system, like how many fish do you have in that tank? And how many like, fish do you need for a 4 by 32 foot long? Good bed? question. And what's your favorite fish? Um, right now I have catfish. I probably have about 30 catfish that range from a half a pound to like two pounds. There's there's not really an exact equation. I mean, it's kind of more of an art. Uh, a low density system like this is basically one pound of fish per 10 gallons of water. Honestly, you can't really equate it like that so much because I think that 10 one tenth pound fish are going to produce a lot more waste than one one pound fish. And I use the analogy of you like an infant. You know, when you have a baby, they're basically changing the diaper as many times <laughs> as you can per day. And then the bigger fish, as they get older, are not producing as much waste because they're not growing and they're not, you know, completely composting it in their own system. So, that's just a general idea of what I recommend for a system like mine. Now, if you did add more mechanical filtration for your water, you can probably get a much denser fish stocking population. It really just depends what you want to do. I mean, a commercial aquaponics farm or a commercial aquaculture facility is going to be a lot closer to a pound per gallon and it's just crazy. I mean, the fish are like the worms, you know. Uh, let me get the guy back there. He, I haven't heard from him. How you doing? Yeah, I mean, you could use clay pebbles. You could use rocks. You could use almost anything. The one thing that you really want to make sure of, if you use any type of gravel, you want to check the pH. Because most of, you can buy a bag of gravel in different sizes, pebbles, river gravel, lime gravel, but most of them will affect the pH of your water. And the main reason I use the cocoa core is because it's neutral and it doesn't affect the pH. This is the key word there, cocoa what? Cocoa core, uh, C-O-I-R, and it comes um, in a brick. It's basically shredded coconut shells. And they call it core. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. C-O-I-R. And it is um, basically shredded coconut shells and then they dehydrate it and it comes in a brick. And then you hydrate that brick and basically it'll expand into uh, a medium. And the, and the vermiculite that I use is good because coca core can really hold water pretty strongly and um, the vermiculite is antibacterial. It's, I mean, it's a naturally occurring thing. It's just a pure rock. It's also pH neutral and it 
helps prevent like bad bacteria from growing in your median as well as giving the median a little bit more aeration. So those are... Have you ever heard of uh, vermiculite being a carcinogen? I have not, but it, uh, I, I don't n know everything. I mean... Yeah, I think that's if you breathe it. Yeah, it's like uh, dust. It's 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 dust. The, the fish that I have, they do eat a lot of algae that grows on the tank. I also try and supplement their diet with duckweed. Um, the one thing you want to make sure of is to keep the duckweed from eating all the minerals that you want your vegetables to have. Um, so you can grow some of the duckweed in your... Yeah, and the fish pretty much keep it down. I mean, they'll eat as much as they want. And then as far as food, you sky's the limit on that. I mean, you can order organic, super duper blueberries and everything, but. Um, so they'll eat um, like garden weight or vegetable waste or yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah, so I mean, it, it depends on the worms. fish. To, I mean, tilapia pretty much will eat anything. And you're gonna have bugs that get into your system, so they'll eat all the mosquito larvae. Uh, and that's another thing I really want to make sure everybody knows is anything that holds water will have mosquitoes. And so anything that I have water in, I do have fish. The, the vegetables, troughs that have, are lined with the rafts, I put mosquito fish in. They're just little minnows. They eat their weight in mosquitoes and they're pretty much bulletproof. I mean, they just breed and I put 20 in each one of those troughs, and now I probably have thousands. I don't, I don't know. Are there any restrictions on using or keeping rainwater? Not that I know of here. Um, I, you know, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question, I guess. <laughs> so catfish are more cold hardy, they get bigger. Um, I don't know, I kind of like the flavor better. Um, I tried them both, so I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't say I prefer one or the other. I mean, I'm just doing catfish now. I have done tilapia. Uh, tilapia do like, they're really tropical. They like hot water. Did you use well water? Did you get your first source when you top off? Well, that's a whole another story, but um, a combination. The very first one I set up, I set up using city water. And I did a lot of research to try and figure out, okay, I know I got chemicals in my city water. What do I do to get rid of them? And originally people said, oh, chlorine, you just pour it out in an open bin and it'll be, um, it'll just dissipate. It's a gas. Well, come to find out, the city of Melbourne and pretty much 90% of all the municipal, well, uh, municipal water systems do not use chlorine anymore. They use what's called chloramine. Chloramine is a combination of ammonia and chlorine. Ammonia is toxic for fish. Chlorine is toxic for fish. You combine them, it's a lot harder to get rid of it. So what you have to do is break that bond. If you break the bond, the chlorine will dissipate and the ammonia will break down from the nitrifying and ammonia bacteria. And the only um, product that I found that had ever been used for fish, for food sources, is called Chloramx. Um, and if you email me, I can send you the, the official name. So I use that. I mean, you basically use a teaspoon for every 100 gallons and it breaks the bonds and then you cycle your water just like you would um, with well water or anything else. It, since then, I've tried to collect as much rainwater as I can and use mostly rainwater. The well water in most of the places that I've been to around here and in my yard is very alkaline. So you're gonna, it's going to take a little more time to acidify it. So if you have some rainwater and some well water and you mix them, you know. It's, 
It's, it's a learning experience no matter how you do it. Exactly. I mean, you could pump it into a, a, you know, a big barrel or something and then try and add lemons or some vinegar or something to acidify it. Do you find any difference in the uh, quality of your yields, um, whether you use the soil engineering or the water engineering, you know, like is one mountain superior to the other? I do, I do think that the, both methods are superior to the other one based on the plant. Um, every plant has its own water and nutrient needs. And the plants that like more water and don't require a, a, a big variety of nutrients are going to grow great in the aquaponics. I mean, if you want to plant celery, if you want to plant lettuce, I mean, the celery that I grew was probably the best example because it's 90% water. and um, the stuff that I grew, just, it just had like a really good flavor, like almost like a salty flavor. But leafy vegetables and greens do great in the aquaponics. The soil gardens, I recommend more for larger fruiting, squash, zucchini, um, cucumber, tomato. Larger fruiting types of uh, plants, I think, need more variety of minerals that are more found with the vermiculture and the soil. That's my experience. Um, well, I did turn to it because I just wanted to produce more. I wanted to uh, produce as much as possible in the small area. And um, I did sell food at Farmer's Market up at Wickham Park for a couple of years. Um, I'm working full time now, so I'm not really doing the Farmer's Markets. Uh, I think that having a closed system kind of gives you more of an even playing field. So I think that in the same respect as your neighbor can grow something different than you can, if you both had closed systems, your climates aren't that much different. I mean, maybe your light sources is based on trees and shade and houses. But with the closed system, you're basically taking away the, the, the variables that are in the ground, which who knows? I mean, somebody could have poured motor oil in their backyard, you know, back in the 50s, and that's just what people did. Yes, sir. Well, there's a, uh, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit on that as well. Um, I really am. Um, more of a, a standoff kind of measure, but I watch the plants and you can tell if something's wrong or the fish. Um, I would recommend measuring your pH every day when you start a system like this. You can also measure for ammonia. And, uh, and these are things that you can measure with a pretty low tech system that you can buy at any aquarium store or pool store. Um, if you wanted to measure dissolved oxygen in the water. That's a pretty expensive piece of equipment. There may be some agriculture extension offices or something that would lend it to you or come to your house if they felt you were, you know, a commercial entity or something. But air on the side of... You know, I, during the cycling, you will actually be able to um, see some nitrogen in your water. But once the bacteria c communities are there and the water is cycled, you, there's almost no measurable nitrogen in my experience. And that, I think, is because the 
nitrifying bacteria basically live on the plant roots and as they convert it, the plants just take it. So I don't really see it in you know, the general water flow. I think maybe if you had a different type of sampling using a, a, like a flood and drain, maybe you would have uh, much more vary in the measurements. But I found that after you go through the water cycling, I almost measure no nitrogen. But the plants are clearly living and thriving, so I don't know. <laughs> Nature. Um, well, the fish are covered. The fish are definitely netted. I mean, you will have birds, hunters. Um, as far as squirrels go, the cats did a good job for a couple years, but they've been getting fat and lazy, so <laughs> it's just something. I mean, uh, fencing, you need some, you need some protection. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you once again. Uh, thank you very much.